Thank you for the invitation. Uh, before uh, starting, I'd like to say a few words about Christoph. Actually, two things. The first one is about his service to the community. And it's, it goes like this. Sometimes in 2010, the board of Annalari Poincaré and uh, its editor-in-chief back then, Vincent Rivasso, were looking for a new uh, editor-in-chief. And uh, we found him in uh, Christoph Kavensky. So I think it was the suggestion of Vincent. And Christoph he immediately accepted with enthusiasm. And I think, you know, he was the right person for two reasons, because he had this enormous dedication to the community you all talked about, and also because he had this breadth of knowledge ranging over all parts of mathematical physics. So he was the ideal person to take up such a role. Now, uh, as it has also been said, he's the guy that when he takes up a duty, he's in charge. And so he decided how this journal would be run, how to set up the editorial board. And uh, also one thing he decided was that the journal had to grow in size because his opinion was that in the community there's, there's much work that is being done that has a hard time to be published and we should give an opportunity to that. The, the second thing is more of a personal reminiscence. I think it was sometimes in 2015 or so, and uh, we were both attending a, a workshop in Adelaide, Australia, and uh, on, a, on, 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 a, on an early afternoon, uh, the, the, the city was struck by a power outage, and the university had to shut down. And so uh, Christoph and I went back to the hotel, we went to my room, and started to talk about what we are doing, what is important in physics, and so on and so forth. And you know, after a while, dusk was falling, and it was clear that soon after, it would be pitch dark. And so it was. And uh, at that point, we were lost. You know, our, our very bodies were lost to our sights, and uh, there was just Christoph and I, Christoph in that room, a room without any, without any reference uh, left, without any boundary seen, and he was talking as usual. So some of you have received notes, some of you have heard, have received personal lectures at the blackboard, but that was not possible. And he was just kept talking. And well, at first this was eerie because you see, civilization had come to a full stop. After a while, it was very comforting hearing a strong voice, always reassuring, you know, he was reasoning in a compelling way. And so he explained me during several hours the conformal bootstrap I knew nothing about before. And then it went on for some time. And uh, late at night, the lights came back. In some way, they spoiled the magic. It was much better during that time. So when earlier this year I heard about the passing of uh, Christoph, it reminded me of this thing. You know, once again, he went out of sight. But I sort of still believe that in some sense, he's still present in a room with no boundary and no center. And if we just want to listen to him, we somehow still can. So these are the few words about Christoph. And now uh, let me move uh, to uh, this talk. So uh, uh, the t title has been said. It's about the infrared problem, in particular in the uh, massless Nelson model. And this is joint work with a former PhD, PhD student of mine, Vincent Beau, and a former uh, postdoc. Uh, Wojciech Dybalski, and the work is supposed to appear in Anna Lenry Poincare in the special issue dedicated to Christoph's memory. So here is an outline which I will skip, and let me give you a vague introduction to the infrared problem. So the infrared problem arises in massless field theories, and it is signaled by various facts, and among them the following two. So you can see it in per perturbation theory, you know, maybe like practitioners do, and you would see Feynman 
uh, diagrams that diverge at small momenta. And another uh, way of seeing it is in mathematical physics, or maybe more restrictively in scattering theory, by the impossibility of defining particles in the sense of Wigner. That is, particles, that objects that have finitely many uh, internal states that, other than that, have just translational degree of freedom. Uh, and this poses a difficulty also for scattering. What are the scattering states we should be talking about? And many solutions have been proposed. I'm not, not able to give a whole history. There are some names on the two sides of the problem. And uh, let me just mention the names in, uh, in mathematical physics, notably scattering theory. Fadeev, Kulish, Blanchard, Buchholz, Fröhlich in his PhD thesis, Morchio and uh, uh, Alessandro Pizzo, uh, 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 whom I will talk about uh, again later in this talk. But I would also like to say that Gavinsky and Kupjainen also thought about it. They constructed massless uh, field theory in renormalization theory, which is not quite scattering theory. So, and the Nelson model is a test bed for solutions to this problem. And uh, here in this talk, there is going to be one more. So the dressed particle is a concept which arises like this. You think of a bare particle all by itself, an electron maybe, that is shrouded by a stationary cloud of uh, field excitations, could be uh, photons or bosons, but in the better case, only finitely many of them. And this is depicted somehow in dia by diagrams like those you see there, which I'm not going to explain further. You probably all know what is meant by them, right? And uh, they are typically appropriate as a description of a dressed particle in case uh, uh, the bosons are masks. Right? And uh, there are also ultraviolet issues, but we won't uh, touch up upon them. And the dressed particle, at least in this sense, may not be an adequate notion for massless bosons. Uh, it depends also a little bit on the coupling and how this coupling behaves in the infrared. But there are two ways out. What do we mean uh, by you know, the infrared particle? One way, they're called A, is to think that this is a stationary cloud, like right, these ones, but the stationary cloud not of finitely many bosons, but of infinitely many bosons, uh, though of finite uh, total energy. And there is another picture called B there, which is that we look at the finite cloud, which is, however, not stationary, but growing, a growing cl cloud of ever softer bosons uh, uh, and ever more uh, numerous bosons, though of bounded total energy. And uh, you can look this in more formal ways in terms of fields and their representations, you know, the canonical commutation relations. And you would see that uh, the solution A is inequivalent, is a representation that is inequivalent to that describing a bare particle or a bare particle uncoupled to the bosons. Whereas the solution B is a, a, an equivalent representation uh, uh, to that. Uh, right. So, in some way, however, uh, the, the case of infinitely uh, many bosons, though never att attained, is some, somehow the limit of the case of finitely many ones. And this at first is disturbing because uh, in, in, in case A, cases A and case B, uh, they live in different Hilbert spaces, in different representations, so it is not immediately clear how one can be the limit of the other. And it sometimes, in some sense, it won't, in some other sense, it will. And uh, here is a manifestation of, of the problem, as you see it by divergences. Uh, here is a, a diagram of Compton scattering to leading order at three level. And uh, you can uh, look at radiative corrections like you see them here. There are two corrections, just more, but as an example, one describing elastic scattering, so the same in and out state as to leading order, and one inelastic where there is an additional 
photon emitted. And let's look at the amplitudes they contribute and then also the cross-section. Well, this one has two more vertices, and so it contributes the level of amplitudes by E squared, but at a level of cross-section that doesn't make E4, because there is a cross term with this one, 1 plus E squared squared, which still gives E squared. However, in the other one, this uh, is just E, right? There's one more uh, vertex. Uh, and the, uh, this has different final states than, than the others, and so this contributes the E squared up to the cross section. So they both contribute to the same order. Uh, and if you look at the cross section to, to that one, that is infrared divergent when you sum over this loop. And this other one, in case two, that's also divergent but small k of this final photon wave. But lo and behold, if you add the two uh, divergences, they cancel. So this is a hint of the fact that we shouldn't really take these two cases separately, a boson that returns and one that escapes. There is no clear cut definition of that because actually there is a cloud of bosons ever growing and you know they never really return, some return and we cannot make a clear cut. And uh, Likewise, this problem persists at higher orders, and this has been studied by many people. And the lesson is that the for us is that the stationary dressed particle is not perturbatively close, close to a bare particle. Since how am I speaking? Since when? Sorry. Ten minutes or so? Twelve minutes, thank you. So let's come to the Nelson model. Uh, it, here it is. You have a particle. Should still stay here. You have a particle, say of mass a, a, n equals one, coupled to a massless bosonic field of frequency uh, omega, the k, given just by the length of the wave vector k. So this is a massless boson. And there's a Hilbert space for the particle, which is just the usual n2 over r3, thought of as position space. Uh, and then there is ob uh, the observable and the momentum of these, which are given by the usual operators. And on the other hand, you have the Hilbert space of the field, which is a bosonic Fox space F constructed over uh, L2 of R3. Once again, but this time R3 is supposed to be the momentum space. And the observables are what you would expect. You construct a, a bosonic field uh, like this phi here. And the uh, dk is actually d3k, and they and they star satisfy the canonical commutation relation. And omega is the vacuum in the Fock representation. The kappa you see here is an ultraviolet cutoff, so we, we don't want to look at ultraviolet issues, so we just want to consider the, the infrared problem. And uh, it is uh, uh, one uh, near zero. So it's zero, uh, it's at zero it is one, and then it falls off uh, slightly above that. And then uh, other operators of concern are the field energy and the momentum, which are just the second quantization of the single boson energy and single boson momentum. Now here in small fonts, you see what I just said. And then there is the joint Hilbert space, which is the tensor product of particle and field Hilbert spaces. And the Hamiltonian, finally, which has the kinetic energy, non-relativistic kinetic energy of a particle, of the, that particle, the, bos uh, the bosonic field energy, and the coupling uh, of the two, which is just the field evaluated at the position of the particle. We also have the total momentum P, which is the sum of the particle and field momentum. So uh, the interaction, just as a motivation, is a scalar counterpart of the interaction you would have in QED. That would, that would be that. And if you take the, the first order term in the coupling E, that would be linear in, in, in the field A, which is replaced here by the scalar field phi, but is still evaluated just at the position of the part. So it's roughly the same thing. And for things to come, let me notice that if you take these two terms, the field energy and the coupling to the particle, uh, it is, it, you can r uh, write it like this, of course, the, the first term is just the, the field energy, but then we put the, a, a k up front, even though it is not part of that, and that just means that in, in, in what we have, we, so we extract the f from things up here, but we also, which is that, but we also divide by the 
modulus of k since we've put it up front and the e to the minus i k x you see here has put, put over here. But the point here is that this goes like k to the minus 3 half at small case and the infrared problem is signaled in this at first in, in this model uh, by the fact that this function f as a function of k uh, is, uh, is not L2. This integral is divergent even though just logarithmically. It however also means in, in the, this, the model is in three dimension, uh, right, uh, correct. Uh, you could look, now you could do one of two things in other dimensions. You could change uh, the coupling uh, uh, appro uh, appropriately to, to keep the problem alive or to say, well, in fact, this, this one of square root of k, this is independent of dimension and the problem may or may not exist in other dimensions. But the three dimension uh, has some justification. So it is not in L2. However, if you make the behavior at small k ever, ever so milder, it will fall into L2. So uh, let me just state on this slide the goal of, of the construction. So first, however, let me remark that the Hamiltonian, the, the Hamiltonian of the Nelson model is translation invariant, so the Hamiltonian and the total momentum commute. So you can look at total momentum as being a good quantum number, thinking just as a number rather as a three vector. And the task of scattering theory, and this is far, far, uh, far more general than, uh, uh, than the Nelson model, is to match complicated trajectories of the model at hand, like e to the minus i, I h d psi, to their simple, possibly simple asymptote. So here is somehow the picture and you want to describe uh, the asymptote by giving some simpler description for psi t. And in the, in the, concretely now, uh, this means that we are looking for an ansatz, it is a map from time to psi t in the total Hilbert space, describing possibly many explicit states so that this, uh, this asymptote is indeed the asymptote of some state and of its true dynamics e to the minus i, uh, h t. And so the arrow should go to zero as time goes to infinity. So that's the first remark there. It's just what I said. And the second remark is that psi t should be a simple ansatz, you know, otherwise the trajectory itself is its own ansatz, which is not of interest. And it should be a simple ansatz describing this ever-growing cloud of ever-softer bosons. And simple means, you know, as uh, my co-author Wojciech Dybalski likes to put it, that it fits on a t-shirt. But it should also be simple in the sense that it has a compelling uh, motivation. And reasonably many means that uh, the, the infinite cloud, which is actually never attained in the Hilbert space, has somehow still a wave function, h of p, which you can choose at will, which can be prescribed at least as a smooth function, so this will determine the asymptote, and you can find the psi, which has then this asymptote. So in order to construct these uh, uh, asymptotic states, let's start with some uh, a simpler model. And the simplest model is ashamingly simple. It's just a harmonic oscillator, right? So a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. And that is the, it comes actually in two versions. One is the Hamiltonian uh, of a harmonic oscillator as we are used to, it is centered, it's a star a, so it is centered in phase space, x and p, so it is centered in a equals zero. And there is a second one in red, which is more re will turn out to be more relevant for our Nelson model, uh, which is displaced, has its center at some complex number f, and therefore its Hamiltonian is that. Now, uh, what is the classical dynamics corresponding to the second Hamiltonian. Well, like the other one, it's just rotation in the plane, but the, the center of the rotation is now f. So it's a t minus f is a minus f rotated uh, by e to the minus omega t. And if you solve this for a, a t, you have the second line there. And uh, one convenient way to express uh, this then in quantum mechanics is to use uh, while operators. So while operators shift states in the complex uh, plane, in the phase space, and here uh, they are, they shift uh, states by f, 
uh, and uh, this is, uh, you know, shown also by conjugating A by, by this uh, vial operator, you get to, to, to minus A. So it shifts this by, by that. And uh, if the, these vial operators have some well-known properties. The first one is that they are projective representations of the translations. The second is this pull-through formula. If you put the, the, the evolution of the centered uh, harmonic oscillator to the left, you can pull it through to the right. But the, the F in the vial has to be moved along. And just as A and uh, H naught and H are uh, related like this, so like A and A minus F, these two Hamiltonians are the conjugate to one another. And so you can write down the propagator of this, the quantum propagator now pretty easily. It's also conjugated, and you can pull this through by this formula here. You get these two together. So it's the formula here on the left. And then you can join them by this projective representation condition, and you get the sum of the two up to some face. In fact, the sum of the two will be something very important that you don't get them individually, but uh, I'll explain that uh, perhaps uh, later. So maybe there is, uh, yeah, no, later. And there are these coherent states whose definition is probably familiar to you, so let me skip that. And if you take such a coherent state, uh, then there are, uh, you can count the excitations. Uh, here's the number operator. You look at the expectation value. Well, it's just given by g squared, g being this complex number. And uh, so this is the, the expectation, but there's a distribution which is Poisson uh, as given there. And uh, in particular, the ground state of H0 is the vacuum, and that of H is a coherent state obtained by displacing the vacuum by, by F. And uh, you can ask what is the tra how many photons you have along such a trajectory, right? This is the trajectory of uh, omega. So you start here, but you rotate about the red point. And the number, the expected number, is given by this expression here. And this is pretty simple because here is the propagator. So you apply to, the, to omega that gives nothing. And, and so you have uh, uh, this uh, vial operator with this function acting and the num expected number is that. And so this oscillates like a sine squared, which is pretty obvious because uh, excitation are created, but then they disappear again in this simple model. So let's now mo move to a slightly more complicated model, which is Van Hove model, and several people here also in the audience have worked about it. And it is related on the one hand, as we shall see, to the Nelson model, because it basically replaces the particle which is in the Nelson model by just an external localized charge. In a sense, it, in a sense space is, is eliminated from the description. And uh, 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 on the other hand, uh, this Van Hove model is also related to the displaced harmonic oscillator we just saw. Instead of having just one, you have a collection of many such displaced harmonic oscillators labeled by K, labels the field modes, and the point is that omega k shall go to zero when k goes to zero. And in particular, this f, this displacement, shall go like the same way it goes in the Nelson model to capture some of its features. And so the Hamiltonian is just this collection of displaced harmonic oscillators. And if you expand this product, there you go. So it just looks uh, uh, like the displaced harmonic oscillator. And uh, maybe this is just, this thing here is just a number, omega k, uh, f k squared, just number, by the way, finite, because so the integral of that would be divergent. This is mitigated by the omega enough that it converges. And so we will occasionally dismiss this term and we'll just make, the effect will be that the ground state is not at zero energy, but at, uh, at some other energy. Now, what else can be said about this Van Hove model? Well, it's a nice uh, operator on the Fox space, uh, L2 of dk, and the vacuum is the usual Fox vacuum. You can have coherent states, which are now uh, labeled. Uh, this was not good. Uh, which are now labeled not by numbers, uh, but by uh, functions in L2. And uh, so you can write such a thing as long as g is in L2. And one of the important points here is that this is meaningless, strictly speaking, when g is not in L2. However, you may still not attach a meaning to, to, to the case where g is not in L2, and that is somehow an infinite cloud 
uh, of, uh, of bosons uh, rather than, than a finite one. And this is sort of also signaled by the fact that the, uh, the, 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 the particle number in such a state is g squared, which is infinite if g is not in L2. Now, this model exhibits a, an infrared problem exactly when f is not in L2. So you can st still formally route, write down this ground state just by displacing the, the, the Fock vacuum by, by this vial, just as in the displaced harmonic oscillator, but it won't, uh, won't be in L2, it won't be in Fock space. And you can see what happens to the boson production along the trajectory. So here is the, the expression we just had for a single one, which you now integrate over k, but even for a single k, this was oscillatory. The integral is not oscillatory because when you look at when about, when t is about uh, omega k, or you choose omega k such as about t, and uh, 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 so this then is no longer small, but oscillates about one or one half or something like this, uh, then you see that this integral is, is going to diverge when, the, cut, when, when uh, the time goes to infinity and therefore you, inter you integrate over ever smaller momentum. So uh, this is the uh, ever-going cloud uh, in this model I, I was talking about before. So uh, for, uh, a few interpretations about uh, uh, this model. So you recall the propagator as we have been writing it uh, down before. So we, we prefer rather not to merge the two things into one. And uh, by just commuting the factors, which we can do, we get the phase. And that phase is uh, fine. This uh, f is uh, not in L2, but when, when it's mitigated, this omega at small k, this becomes integral. So that's a nice phase. And uh, uh, the phase uh, oscillates down to zero when t goes to infinity. So we can sort of uh, neglect it. And uh, uh, the trajectory is uh, the left-hand side. And the asymptote is, is therefore uh, what we keep here without this phase, which in the limit becomes irrelevant. And I've just added in uh, the, this ground state energy with, because we may have dropped the, the, the C number term in the Hamilton. So this is the trajectory, and this is uh, uh, the, uh, the asymptote. And uh, one way of uh, reading this is this. Is, so yes, so here is just what the, uh, the, the result from the slide before. No, wrong, wrong way, and again. And here is that these two operators are separately ill-defined, but the product I is well-defined because, uh, because of the usual thing. Oh, this is going to, the battery is low here anyway. So again, uh, the, when you take these two, these two things together, then this is in L2. So somehow you should think like this. This is this, the whole thing is this growing cloud. This is the infinite cloud, and what you remove is something decreasing in time, though still infinite, to keep it finite at any given time. Right. This is what it says here. This is the stationary infinite cloud. This is the growing cloud, and you may notice that this object, now at least when f is in L2, converges to weakly to zero. But this w doesn't converge to w to zero. This is a little subtle thing. But it still converges to the w of zero being the identity. It still converges to the multiple of the identity, this one, which happens to be the overlap of the bare ground state and the dressed ground state. And one way of writing the equation up here is to put this on the other side and uh, divide by the, the limiting C number value of that, was there a question? No, no. By the limiting C value number of that, divide it, and then it says that the weak limit of this quotient is, uh, is the dressed Hamilton. Now, this is a formula you probably all saw in quantum field theory, the Gelman law formula. I think it was also mentioned in, in, in Jan's talk, this problem. This is, in some sense, still fine when F is in L2, but when F is not in L2, which is our concern, uh, this thing is uh, ill-defined. Uh, however, uh, the whole thing still tells us that we are on the right track by considering these things and separating them like we are doing there. So here is the Nelson model in more detail. Uh, here you see it again. 
And uh, any psi, you know, there is this, uh, the fact that the, the, the two commute, and therefore the, the, the p can be replaced by a good quantum number, right, like this. And therefore you can sub, sub, uh, decompose any state psi into a superpositions of improper states, so not states in the Hilbert space, however having a definite uh, uh, total momentum little p, and uh, the operator total momentum act, acts fiberwise in this de decomposition. And uh, there is another point of view, which is to take uh, the, the original definition of the, of, the, of the Hilbert space, so L2 of the particle times the Fox space, which you can look at Fox space value functions over, over R3, here they are, psi of x is in the Fox space, and if you translate just the, the particle like this, so you do this, and this is the total thing minus the field uh, momentum, you end up with this equation here, which says that in such a plane wave, the, as you would expect, by the way, the, the value of the, of the plane wave at some point x is related to the point, the, the value of point zero by this translation operator, or translation operator, translation of just the part. So this is the conclusion of this little thing. Here it is at the basis of the lilo pines transformation which uh, takes the total Hilbert space and just takes the value at zero of that, which then is in the Fox space, and, it, and, and, and determines a sort of a Fourier transformation uh, where the, the Hamiltonian, the Nelson Hamiltonian now acts fiberwise, and its fiberwise action would be that one. Basically, it just amounts to put the electron at, at position zero, and also the electron momentum or the particle momentum is now replaced by the total momentum minus the field. It's pretty obvious what it, what it is. And uh, before coming up with the scattering ansatz, let's have a look at the spectrum of this uh, Nelson Hamiltonian, or actually at, at the fiber of it. But in order to do that, it's better to look at the joint spectrum of the total thing uh, uh, and, and, the, and the total uh, momentum. So because of the little p being a good quantum number, you can decompose it like this. And, uh, so th and for lambda equal to zero, where there is no coupling, the two parts, particle and, and field, they separate, and you can just add uh, the spectra by setwise addition. And uh, so this will be a, a parabola of a non-relativistic particle. And uh, this will come, up, come from the single uh, bosons, which have this uh, uh, momentum and this uh, energy, and you just, according to second quantization, sub sum them up, and so it's the cone generated by these things. As a picture is here, the parabola, and then you setwise add to it any such cone and many such cones, and what you then get is the region depicted on the right, right, which is at the beginning a parabola, but farther out than the the speed of the particle exceeds that of the, of the, of, of the bosons, uh, it, it turns over into a cone li like this. And uh, uh, this, uh, if you now ask about the spectrum of this guy, you just go at the fixed little p, you go down and you see what, what you have here and where it came from. It came from the back. So and that thing, that is an eigenvector, right? It's an eigenvector for all p, but only between minus one and one, it is a ground state because here it is, is going to be merged in the continuum. Now something pretty drastic happens when you turn the lambda on and uh, it's just a small perturbation of the picture as a set, but the bottom of the spectrum here does no longer correspond to uh, an eigenvalue of, uh, of the fiber Hamiltonian and that is the infrared problem pretty much as we saw it in the Van Hove model, and it has no ground state in the Fox space. And in order to cure that, you could cure it like with the Van Hove model. So in the Van Hove model, actually the Van Hove model originated by displacing a, a centered collection of uh, oscillators by, by F, and so we, we do the inverse, and we construct the blue counterpart to that, uh, by some uh, choice of function f, 
which however is not exactly uh, the function f of the model. It has to be changed slightly uh, like this, but it's still not in L2. And in fact, if you take it for different total momenta, p and p prime, even the difference is not in L2, which means that uh, the two transformations you are going to do are lead to different representations for different values, of, or to inequivalent representations for different values of, of the momentum p. There is a heuristic argument which says that uh, it, it, it should be chosen like that. So it goes back to Morchio. So you say maybe if Xi has an infrared problem, so it, it looks something like this, even though this is not in L2. And then the argument says that there's been exactly uh, to be chosen like that. And therefore, we write it formally to find a, a conjugate, formally conjugate Hamiltonian to HP, but just formally because this is not, is not unit in, in, in Fox space, which has no infrared problem. And indeed, uh, there is this remarkable theorem of Pizzo who showed that uh, if, you, if you go to this infrared uh, representation, HP0 has a ground state at the bottom of the spectrum. And there it is. And that one is pretty close to the usual Fock vacuum. In fact, it goes to that when the coupling goes to zero. Let me skip the idea of proof for the sake of time. Even it's, I mean, the, the result is, is not easy. Uh, but the idea was, would have been somewhat easy. And now let's finally try to get to this coupling ansatz. So again, uh, uh, let me recall things of the Van Hove model. You have the infinite cloud, which is this red thing. So whenever you see something red, it means it's, it's not properly defined. It's somewhere uh, lying outside of, of Hilbert space. And uh, if you want to look at it as a function of time, you would add in this previous phase here. And then uh, the trajectory, uh, uh, as we saw it, the, the true trajectory has uh, such an asymptote where you have this infinite thing, but you remove an equally infinite thing, remove, this is the minus sign, and this somehow goes weakly to zero, at least if f were in L2. And so you remove less and less, and you create a true growing cloud. And uh, in the Nelson model, what has to be said on top of that is that you have this translation invariance I alluded to. And once you go to the infrared representation, you have the, the, the ground state. So in the red, uh, without going to the infrared representation, that state should be obtained from this omega p by applying the non-existent while transformation. So you're out of the Hilbert space. Now you can set up uh, the ansatz by putting all things together. First, let's put up uh, a stationary cloud, the infinite. So you, you take this, this stands for that, you have to put uh, this translation into so, so as to get it to an arbitrary point. And then you also have to put this phase in here. So that's the result you get for the, for the cloud, even though it is not sitting in Hilbert space. But we want to trust this expression a little bit. And here is the growing cloud where you remove from that pretty much what you removed here. And the only difference here is that in respect to the time dependent phase, now that which means stated space, there's also the space dependent phase, and that's what you have to remove. And so that is going to be the ansatz for the growing cloud. And uh, let's see what, what it gets. So we put these things together. And now, uh, as it was to be expected, uh, uh, this thing here is again, so uh, we put them together and then we get this phase, right? And now, why is this in, why is this not, um, okay, now it went. So now you have this while transformation with this function, which at small k goes to zero, the, the bracket goes to zero. So this is going to be in L2. And so the whole ansatz is in L2 as it should. And uh, here is finally the growing cloud ansatz in this equation star. Here is the theorem that results. Uh, a small coupling lambda for any smooth H of HP supported in the, should be in p less than one, but for technical reasons, it's a little bit less. The ansatz given there of this growing cloud of ever softer bosons is asymptotic to the trajectory of some state, the true trajectory of some state, 
like this, and the map which associates H to this psi, which gives the, uh, the, the true trajectory, is one to one. So there is, it's not, you know, it's not that something is all just set to zero and, and, and things happen. And just to have an appreciation for what this is worth, you know, this limit really occurs in the Hilbert space H. And it, suppose you have two states which differ, you know, the, uh, zillions of photons each, zillions of bosons each. But suppose they just differ in one, in, in, in the count of one. Then these are orthogonal states. The fact that they are equal means that they differ for, by far less than counting one bosons, despite that they are huge and growing. Now, uh, I think I should try to converge to a conclusion, right? So let me just uh, say one remark on the, on the proof. Uh, so how would the proof go? You would put uh, the e to the ht, which, uh, which you have on the other side of the equation to the right-hand side, and you would like to show that this is a limit, which then would be this state psi. And this is done, the existence of this limit is done by called Cook's method, which, shows, which amounts to showing that the derivative of this by t by t is integrable. And uh, the nice thing about about that is that this derivative is given by a very simple uh, expression uh, which is pretty much the same as the answer seen before. There's just this gamma tilde which comes in. And now you, you see you may even by their eyes see why this uh, goes to zero and perhaps integrable. When you look at this thing here, this de describes a wave packet of the particle. And the particle has a certain non-relativistic dispersion, at least in the range of p's we are considering. And there it, it is far less than the velocity of light. Whereas if, if you look at this error or this thing you have to integrate out, where is that localized? It also shows some oscillations. But this oscillation is uh, localized on the light cone. right? And therefore, this wave packet here is going to ever more avoid this light cone because it's it, proceeds much smaller, and therefore this whole expression is going to be small. And technically this is done by some phase, uh, by some uh, stationary phase approximation, and it makes use of some properties known by, by being derived by other people before us about the regularity of, of the, the energy of P and some less regularity about the ground state. So I think with that, I would just like to rush to the conclusions because uh, there are some comments on, on earlier work. I won't deep give that. So it's just a summary of what, what I tried to give. It's a construction of infraparticle states in the masters nelson model. And it is placed in Fox space, so not in some infrared representation. It's just used for motivation. But the construction itself, the scattering ansatz, is placed in Fox space. But the infraparticle is therefore not stationary. It's this growing cloud. And uh, the description of such a state is given in fairly closed form. So it was not the first description of equivalent states, but I think the description is uh, fairly uh, simpler and, and, and perhaps better uh, motivated. And with that, I would like to thank you. Thank you for the talk. Are there questions? In this description of, of uh, uh, growing infraparticle cloud, uh, is it, uh, do you have to make some arbitrary choices, or is, is it uh, um, canonical? I would say I would say it's fairly canonical. I mean, you know, there are always little choices you have to make. Let, let me give you one. Uh, if I get it, yes, it's still further back. Right. You see the equation star there, right? So <laughs> you cannot take f 
to, to do the, the vial conjugation uh, because you wouldn't get to the right space where the Hamiltonian has a ground state. But you could take something which differs from that by, by, by something which is in L2. In this sense, it's just the, the, the tail behavior which is unique. The concrete function you choose is not, even though this is the most natural choice. Yeah, so uh, what, what about the following question? So, uh, so, uh, so suppose I wanted to have some canonical objects, for instance, uh, cross sections. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, the, so so the the experimenter, the physicist would would like to to get uh, uh, unique uh, numbers, uh, uh, which describe, for instance, cross sections. Can you give uh, uh, a recipe to to Kimo to carry? No. So first of all, <coughs> this would be a recipe for inclusive cross sections because there is this problem I mentioned at, at the beginning. Uh, So inclusive means that uh, that you fix the uh, that, that the observable which some si some so somehow underlies uh, uh, the, the, the the cross section uh, is blind to the number of very soft photons that have been emitted, right? and uh, uh, so I think one can fairly give a fairly. Uh, canonical definition of that. You see, uh, above, uh, above a certain tre infrared threshold, you can do, if you think you have a, a, a one definite uh, choice, you can take it. The only modification that has to be made in order to get this description is at very small uh, k. Thank you.